This uh, series about Indigenous learning was inspired by the discovery of the graves outside so many of the residential schools. Many people said they were just shocked. They had no idea that residential schools could be so bad, much less that children could actually die at school. And so over the summer, uh, we've been talking about why uh, Canada created this particular relationship with Indigenous people through legislation like the Indian Act and uh, through the reserve system. And today is our last one in this series before we yield this floor to the children starting next week. Um, I want to talk about residential schools themselves, which inspired this whole series. Residential schools officially started in the 1880s in Canada, and they were originally conceived as basically um, uh, labor schools, industrial schools. And they are inspired by the example of industrial schools from other nations like New Zealand and the United States and even Sweden. All of those nations had decided that they too had what they called an indigenous problem or the Indian problem. And what they wanted to do was assimilate these people into settler society by making them skilled wage laborers. And so it seems fitting to talk about this on Labor Day weekend. And so the children were taken from their families in Canada and taken far away to go to what were essentially boarding schools where they would be taught, the girls would be taught how to sew and how to, um, how to be domestics so they could work in homes as maids. And meanwhile, the boys were supposed to be learning um, practical, practical skills so they could work in factories. Here's a picture of what um, a residential school looked like. Um, these are girls. Uh, you don't see any boys in the picture because the schools were segregated. The boys and the girls were kept separate which meant that if you had a brother or a sister at a residential school, you wouldn't be able to see them. You know, boys were with boys, girls were, the, were with girls. The schools were harsh because their goal was to assimilate the children and educate them in Western ways. They were discouraged from being able to express any part of their culture. They were punished often quite severely for speaking their own language or um, adhering to any aspect of their culture. It was a terrorizing form of education for indigenous children who had a very different style of um, parental uh, upbringing in their home communities. The entire residential school system was based on a paradox, a paradox which has haunted it all the way through. On the one hand, the federal government wanted children to be assimilated into Western culture so they could just become like everybody else. They were essentially being treated like immigrants who should just blend in. And to do that, they needed to learn settler ways. But on the other hand, the whole system was based on a sense of contempt for indigenous people. And as a result, the residential school system was hobbled from the very beginning. If it had actually wanted to teach these children real skills, it failed terribly because the schools were chronically underfunded throughout their entire history, which stretched from the 1880s to 1996. That underfunding meant that the children were conscripted to work at the schools, not just learn there. And what happened in practice was the children were often found that half of their time was spent doing menial chores around the school, doing laundry, washing the floors, doing maintenance on the building if you were a boy. And as a result, the education was terrible. By the age of 18, many, many students from residential schools graduated with grade five educations. And then they were booted out and told, go make your way. And of course, with a grade five ed education at the age of 18, you're not going to be able to go into any universities. So they'd been taken away from their families. They'd been taken away from their culture and taught that everything that they knew from their families and culture was wrong, and then given a substandard education in our ways. The system was just doomed to fail. And one of the ways in which it failed, just spectacularly, was in terms of the health and welfare of those children. Early on, it was recognized and statistically established that in the residential schools, there was an appalling death rate from diseases like tuberculosis. In 1907, a federally sponsored report found that up to over just over 25% of students who went to residential schools were dying at the residential schools. The person who write, wrote this report in 1907, Bryce, 
found this absolutely appalling and told the newspapers and anyone who would listen. But the federal government didn't do anything to change it. And it may seem strange, I'm sorry, I'm not checking my email, I just want to read a quote for you. It may seem strange that the federal government didn't leap to try and make the schools healthier and safer for children because, of course, no child should ever die at school. But the thing was that the federal government had conceived this whole system to get rid of the, in, the so-called Indian problem. Assimilation was one way, but so was death. And here's a quote from 1920 from the man who ran the uh, department of what was called Indian Affairs back then, Duncan Campbell Scott. He said, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think as a matter of fact that the country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. That is the whole object of this bill. The aim of the residential school system was to make Indian culture go away. It was to make indigenous people go away. So the federal government wasn't shocked and appalled by the fact that children were dying in residential schools because that was one way of dealing with the problem. Of course, it didn't work. The, this whole approach was just appalling in its application, appalling in its inspiration, and appalling in its consequences. The children who survived the residential school system went back to their communities, having been taught that their community's culture was substandard, and yet they came without much skills of their own because they'd gotten such a substandard education at the residential schools. They'd been denied the chance to live a normal childhood with their parents, so when they became parents, they suffered all sorts of difficulties in child raising. All of this is recognized by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which heard the testimony of hundreds, even thousands of people who talked about what it was like to be in the residential school system and what happened afterwards and how it is being a corrosive force in indigenous society. In the 1950s, it finally became clear that the residential school system wasn't working very well, so the emphasis shifted towards trying to provide care for indigenous children through the child welfare agencies. This was not a perfect solution either since it meant that many uh, children were simply taken away from their families and given, over up, given up for adoption to white families. Uh, this has been called the 60s scoop. And the problem persists even today. Although there are schools on reserves now, which is definitely progress where children can learn about their own culture as well as um, Western ways of understanding the world. Often those schools end at grade eight or grade nine, so the children, if they want to get high school, which of course is critical for getting by in our society, need to leave their reserve and go down to um, other big cities where they may not know anybody. And that too, of course, is a shocking and difficult transition for children to make. How many of us would want to send our teenagers alone to a distant city in a different culture? So many problems persist. The United Church of Canada was one of many churches who ran residential schools. We apologized in 1986. The Canadian government followed much later in 2008 and made an apology. But we still have a long way to go. But hopefully, by understanding more about how we got here, we can try and chart a better way forward with Canada's Indigenous peoples. We should all remember that our faith tells us that we are, human beings are all made in the image of God. Our mistake with the residential school system was in thinking that we could make Indigenous people made in our image. May we not make that mistake again.